Thanks, Howard, very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joanella Morales. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a program director in the Division of Genomic Medicine at the NHGRI. It is my pleasure to welcome you back to day two of the workshop. And I'm really excited to introduce session three to you, which is focused on the application of multiomics to observational studies. We have four terrific presentations lined up today, and I'm very much looking forward to them. But first, let me say a few housekeeping items to sort of reiterate some of the things Howard mentioned just now. Each presenter will have 10 minutes to give their presentation and then five minutes of, uh, to answer questions. And for the participants, if you do have questions, feel free to add them to the chat, but I will also be checking for raised hands. And as Howard said, when there is one minute left, I will chime in and let the speaker know. And I think that's all I've got. So with that, let's get into it. And so our first speaker is Dr. Nathan Price. Dr. Price is CEO of Longevity, a division of Thorn Health Tech. He is also a professor at the Institute for Systems Biology, where he and Lee Hood co-direct the Hood Price Lab for Systems Biomedicine. His research interests are in computational biology, systems medicine, scientific wellness, translational bioinformatics, and biological networks. Dr. Price will be speaking to us today about using polygenic risk scores combined with multiomics data to provide insights into prodromal disease and prevention. Over to you, Dr. Price. Great, well, thanks so much, uh, Jonella. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with, uh, with everyone today. Uh, as uh, all the stuff I'll talk about today was work that was done at ISB, as was recently mentioned, I've moved my full-time locus to uh, longevity recently. Um, uh, but remain on, on leave at ISB. So I was asked to talk about polygenic risk scores and how they interface with uh, multiomics. So that's what I'm gonna dive into today. And I'm gonna try in the next 10 minutes to go through two brief stories. So uh, this started for us with something called the Pioneer 100 project, which was uh, 100 people where we uh, started doing multiomics data of various different types. Uh, this involved things like whole genome sequencing, measuring about 1,200 different analytes out of the blood, uh, doing measurements of the gut microbiome. These were all done uh, on three-month intervals uh, during this period, uh, looking at wearable devices, uh, trackers, uh, Fitbits, things of that nature. Uh, the idea behind something that we called scientific wellness was to try to take this information, make it actionable, relevant for people in their lives, so hopefully they would go on a journey with us over time, and then to develop through this, creating personal dense dynamic data clouds or deep phenotyping, the kind of thing that we're all talking about here for multiomics longitudinally. And the goal in this study was not to do it around a particular disease, but to try to understand what happens in a general population uh, before uh, maybe a lot of them have gotten into a disease state. Uh, following that, we had started a company, which is now out of business, but called Aravail. And we were able to generate these kind of data over a period of about four years uh, on nearly 5,000 people, uh, demographics here, and I won't go through that in detail uh, in this 10 minutes. So uh, what have we learned so far from analyzing these data? We have a slew of papers on this. I'm just gonna talk about two of them today that are related to polygenic risk scores. So uh, this was work led uh, primarily by Michael Weinberg, who's a postdoc in my group, as well as with contributions from Laura Heath, John Earls, and Andrew Majus, looking at how deep phenotyping uh, can help us look at uh, the manifestation of genetic risk in the body as interpreted from PRSs. So the basic idea here is pretty simple. This is all published in a paper in PNAS last year, if people want to look at the details. Uh, as individuals, we all, all, all carry uh, variants affecting uh, our predisposition for different traits. Those genetic variants, of course, a genetic variant doesn't mean much in a test tube. It means something in your body must result in some sort of altered biological function, some way that it carries out uh, whatever those differential risk factors are. And if we do broad enough measures, there's a reasonable chance that we can capture some of what those genetic variants do even way in advance of any disease symptoms by looking at multiomics data. So metabolites, proteins, clinical labs were the main elements we were looking at here. But basically, do we see strong correlations with those uh, in a general population? So 
for this study, we went through, uh, Michael did a great amount of work on this, basically went through every published GWAS study that was available at the time. Uh, we had some quality control cutoffs and we identified what we thought were 54 GWAS that were well powered, uh, often that had multiple studies behind them uh, that identified genes that were associated with all of the different uh, disease or trait categories that are shown here. And in essence, then built a polygenic score, basically just doing uh, a summation across the, um, across the, um, uh, the uh, risk variants and building a polygenic scores for each of those or taking ones that had already been built. And then the novel part here was to then use this in the context of these 5,000 people that we had uh, amassed to see were there correlations that we could identify in the proteins, metabolites, or clinical measures associated with these traits? So by doing that, we were able to show that we could do analytes that correlated with uh, these polygenic risk scores, as won't be too surprising, hopefully. Uh, clinical labs uh, turned out to be the most correlated with those scores. That makes sense. We've curated clinical labs because of their relationship to disease, but also a bunch of unknowns from the metabolites and proteins uh, popped up as being associated with these. And I'll just give in the, in the minute or so I have for this story, uh, just some simple examples. So this is just taken from the top of the list alphabetically. There are 756 associations that we found for altered either proteins or metabolites or clinical measures uh, associated with these polygenic risk scores. Uh, some of them are, are quite interesting, I think. Uh, ALS had uh, quite an interesting one in the sense that it showed that people who had really high genetic risk for ALS tended to have higher amounts of, um, uh, was correlated with higher amounts of omega-3s and lower amounts of omega-6s. Uh, that's, that's interesting because that's kind of the opposite of what we think of typically as omega-3s being healthy, omega-6s being unhealthy. Uh, we did find after that a paper in an ALS mouse model that showed that omega-3s actually accelerated the disease and omega-6 uh, delayed it, uh, delayed neurodegeneration in that model. Uh, so this is indi indicative of the fact that if we look at polygenic risk scores for a population, there can be some personalization to what you may or may not care about or the degree to which you would care about something based on your particular risk profile. It also pulled up some really interesting analysis uh, proteins in the sense that for example, coronary artery disease, there's only one protein out of all the 400 that we looked at that was correlated with the polygenic risk score for uh, coronary artery disease in asymptomatic population. Turned out that was PCSK9, which of course the biggest blockbuster drug there. Asthma was the same thing. We found one protein that was associated with polygenic risk of asthma. That's under uh, apparently uh, in clinical development with four different clinical trials ongoing on it as a potential target for treatment. So I think you get a pretty interesting signal for these early stages when you look at asymptomatic population because you haven't had yet had all the response to disease. So implications for the future from this first part is that depending on a person's individual genetic profile, you can provide a prioritization of choices that they might make and you can map the most genetically at risk people for disease and tailor approaches to trying to deal with the ways that that may manifest before they get disease. So the second uh, topic I wanna go through in the three or so minutes that are remaining is around the notion that you can also look at this multiomic uh, deep phenotyping data to evaluate what are the effects on uh, of lifestyle change. And so here we have a polygenic risk score. Turns out that you can predict for LDL cholesterol, you can predict it pretty well from the genome. So that's not, you know, it doesn't know if you're vegetarian or you're, you know, you like to eat cheeseburgers every day or whatever it is, but basically you can get a pretty strong genetic signal for LDL. And, the, and today, because we don't really use genetics much in clinic outside of uh, cancers and a few other little pockets, uh, we treat these individuals as the same. And so the question is, if you have elevated LDL cholesterol, and you have it there because it's predicted by genetics versus it's there because of lifestyle, is there a difference? And what we found, uh, which I found really quite fascinating was that we just bend people into five buckets. And in essence, what we saw is that if there was a big gap, if their genetics predicted they would be low, but they were high, when they went through a lifestyle intervention, they were able to lower their LDL cholesterol successfully for 40% of people. So that's a big number. Now, the upper 40% of people, 
were not able to lower their LDL cholesterol. In other words, their genetics predicted they'd be high. They were high. When they tried to move it down by lifestyle, they in fact uh, could not do that. This has implications, which we could get into, and we'll have a big paper coming out on it next year, hopefully uh, around statin usage and things like that. Uh, so we could get more into that uh, later. But essentially what this shows is that there's a big difference in individuals uh, based on what their genetics predict and how they respond then to trying to intervene. So another element here then is just to give a second example is here around HDL, same thing. This is a genetic prediction. It shows that, again, it's very strongly, um, uh, there's a, a strong genetic component to it, uh, which is shown here. And if you ask the same question, are people able to change their HDL? What we saw was that for most people, they were in fact not able to change it if their genetics were predicting that their HDL was low, they had trouble raising it. But if their genetics predicted that they would be high, and this is all normalized to the beginning uh, start value, those individuals were able to change. So again, that gap makes a big difference. So One imp minute. Yep, implications for the future. Genetics are not destiny, but they quantitatively affect the outcome for lifestyle interventions. And we can design health strategies for people that highlight the areas where the most progress is likely. In other words, you can create a delta around every different clinical measure that a person has where they have their genome working with them rather than against them. And you can map that out for someone uh, in their entirety uh, based on this kind of data. So with that, I thank everyone that did the work along the way. And uh, thanks to Lee also, who's been a great partner throughout all of this. And that is nine minutes and 58 seconds. Thank you. And I'm done. Thank you, Dr. Price for that fantastic um, presentation. I'm, I'm looking to see if there are any questions, I don't see any raised hands. Neil has his hand up. Thank Donella. you. Go ahead, Neil. So thank you for that, it was really interesting. So <clears throat> I wondered whether you're, um, in these analyses, you're able to see the contribution to ancestry in any of these? or if things differed by different ancestral groups or populations? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, the answer is in most of these cases is yes, right? That it does make a difference. Uh, our population was you know, pretty heavily Caucasian and then Asian, and then it's fairly smaller in the others just from the way it was a self-selected group coming in. But if you do, we've looked at a number of, of different items like this and typically if you incorporate something like a genetic sequence and you just take the, you know, the, the first, you know, N principal con components and map uh, genetics in that way, you do find that there are significant differences and, and associations across a lot of these traits. And it's a huge issue, obviously, because I'm a big believer that we'll view it as archaic as interpreting blood in the absence of genetics pretty soon. And I, I'm, you know, pushing hard <laughs> as many of the people on this call are in the healthcare system for trying to get that adoption. And that will be a huge element that when everyone's genetics is in there and that will take care of ethnicity to some degree, right? Because that's kind of a subsection of genetics, but we really should be interpreting all of that data in the context of what a person's genome says. And there's a huge amount of work to do to make that better uh, and more equitable as well. Thanks. Thanks, I see Nancy's hand up. Oops, Nancy, if you're trying to speak, we cannot hear you. You're on mute. Yeah, no, I-, I There you are. I was asking me to, to unmute in two places and I was oh, trying no. to come both. Um, so the, the concept of this Delta, I think is really interesting. The genetic component versus the non-genetic component. But I think it is relevant to note that for some biomarkers, LDL cholesterol is a great example of one. There's, a, there's already data, clear data indicating that both the genetic and the non-genetic components are predictive of the outcomes. The reason that we use these, that, that as a biomarker. But, but I think there will be, there are plenty of biomarkers where the genetics really is noise for how we need to use the biomarker, that the delta, is the better biomarker 
And I think in contrast, there's at least a few, especially of the newer metabolomic biomarkers that turn out to be a single DNA variant in a single protein. That is the, that is the, the sort of biomarker, which we probably measure better directly just with the genetics rather than, than the metabolomics. But, and, and so I, I, I'm thinking we need the genetics in part to, to do a better job with some of these biomarkers where the genetics is creating ancestry mean differences, differences in the variances for a biomarker where all of the genetics is noise for how we use the biomarker. And think of something like the way we use cystatin C and its heritability of 40, 40 to 60% based on family studies. So it's a, I, I, I do think people have not internalized how heritable biomarkers are, how much of that is sometimes predictive of the outcomes. It's just, you know, it may be mostly the genetics that is predictive and maybe we ought to just use the genetics then, but there are definitely biomarkers that we, I think we can make better by focusing on that Delta. Yeah, Nancy, I, I agree with everything you said uh, very much because what we, you know, what we, and I don't want to imply, we've done, a lot of p scientists have looked at this, but I just mean, if you walk into your general clinic, right, they don't, they don't use this at all right now in typically, right? Maybe a few pockets, you know, you go to, you know, go to Mike Snyder's fancy clinic, you know, you'll get this, but, you know, but in most places you don't, you don't get that. And so, but it's true that we should interpret, you know, in my opinion, we should, you know, we should do an evaluation at least of an interpretation of every single clinical lab we measure of what the genetic component is, what's the non-genetic. And you're exactly right. For some, it won't make that much difference. The genetics not that big a factor. We can use it like we have. For others, the genetics might be almost the whole ball game or it's noise. And we, we start getting a much tighter, much like the LDL cholesterol. You know, the reason I do the lifestyle examples is there's a ton of literature and it says, well, you can kind of change it and you kind of can't. And it's, you know, it's, and there's some people it does and some, and it's like, it's this murky thing and you put genetics on, it's like, well, you can actually predict who will and who won't. Pre and it's pretty strong prediction. You know, it's not perfect. You know, there's still some individuality, but you saw the numbers 40% at the bottom for LDL can move it really nicely. 40% at the top. It's really rare that they can do it. And so, you know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of elements in there, and we should just be looking at that for all the biomarkers systematically that we use in medicine because it's a big it's a big uh, factor. Thanks, Dr. Price. I'm afraid we've run out of time, so we'll have now to move on. And I see that there were hands that raised that weren't we didn't I, we didn't get a chance to get to. If you don't mind putting your question on the chat, so that um, Dr. Price could could respond. I, I see a few other questions also on the chat. Okay, so let's move on to our second speaker. That's Dr. Carrie Nadeau. She is the Nadesi Foundation Endowed Professor of Medicine and Pediatrics and Director of the Sean Parker Center for Allergy and Asthma Research at Stanford University. She is also the Section Chief in Asthma and Allergy in the Pulmonary Allergy and Critical Care Division at Stanford. Dr. Nadeau's interest lies in understanding how environmental and immune and genetic factors affect allergies, immune tolerance, and asthma. And today she will be speaking to us about understanding how multi-omics tracks environmental influences. Floor is yours, Dr. Nadeau. Thank you so much. And thank you to Howard and uh, Judy for inviting me here today and for the meeting organizers and happy Juneteenth Day, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. I feel very lucky to be among you because our fields merge in so many ways and we've learned from each other. And I also uh, have been working with um, some of our colleagues at Stanford, including uh, Howard and Mike, who's uh, previously given a talk here today. So it's thanks to a lot of collaborations that we're here today to be able to talk about how multi-omics track environmental influences. So today I'll talk about uh, measuring exposures and why we do that, the tools to perform multiomics, as many of you are aware, and then some examples of how we've used an approach to a uh, sampling observational cohort uh, for exposure to pollution, which is a, uh, a cohort in the Central Valley, um, and then an exposure to diet, which is a 
uh, a twin cohort here with mono, monozygote twins. And then I'll just add some conclusions. So importantly is why do uh, we monitor exposures? Why is this relevant? Well, of course, as all of you know, in the context of climate change, this is really critical to understand how we monitor exposures in relationship to genetic risk factors and genetic variants and epigenetics. And with a lot of the tools in multiomics now to understand to what degree DNA and cellular changes occur after climate change issues like air pollution, increased allergens, extreme heat, severe weather, environmental degradation, living conditions, social issues, as we've spoke about uh, being Juneteenth, but also environmental justice issues with many people of color, uh, unfortunately, bearing the brunt of climate change and being targeted uh, with zoning laws in those areas that have the most toxic emissions. Uh, there's also changes in vector ecology. Um, and so understanding genetics of, uh, of humans, but also other uh, vectors and uh, potentially animals is going to be important. Water and food supply impacts and then water quality impacts. And for me as an immunologist, I find it very instructive to be able to put this paradigm together to look at different environmental factors and how they affect the development of immune tolerance. Because as an infant, we have been exposed to many different conditions and throughout the world, infants are exposed to different conditions, but you can see here the amplitude of signals that one could potentially assay for any genetic risk factors with epigenetics and with different exposures that are monitored in the environment. And why is it important to look at the immune system? Well, from my perspective, it can really help understand prevention and treatments as Dr. Price just mentioned in some of the adult diseases. For me, understanding the development of the immune system over time, the immune system has both acute and chronic measures. There are cells that turn over every six hours like neutrophils, and there are cells that can live up to 100 years like T memory cells. And so you can look at these cells and infer then to what degree an exposure had an effect on their DNA, on other aspects of the cellular physiological mechanisms, but that you can attribute it based on the timing of the half-lives of these cells and based on the timing of exposure. And for me as a pediatrician and as an adult doctor, I wanna understand how this moves forward within the lifespan of any individual, because it's not just about one exposure, it's about chronic exposures and repeat exposures over time. So again, for example, within our approach, we look at detrimental environmental exposures like pollution, tobacco smoke, pesticides, diet, how that affects the immune system in particular, and then how that potentially leads to disorders like asthma, allergy, cardiovascular disease, obesity, and cognition. And just getting down in the weeds a little bit more, we know from mouse studies and from human studies that, for example, diesel exhaust pollution, DEP, activates alveolar macrophage, for example, the lung depicted here, and with epithelial barrier defects and activation through toll-like receptors and through alarm and signaling, you see a pro-inflammatory cascade of inflammasomes, as well as T-cell differentiation to a hyper-inflammatory pathway. And that can also occur through aryl hydrocarbon receptor directly through volatile organic compounds that are coming uh, through the lung, as well as through uh, the skin, for example, externally. So when we understood some of these mechanisms that were coming out of animals, we wanted to understand whether or not these same hypotheses could be attributed in humans. And so in the Central Valley in California, which is one of the poorest areas of the country, uh, we decided to focus because there's an environmental justice issue here. There are many people uh, that are, are of color and that are exposed to high amounts of air pollution from agriculture, from uh, industry, but then also because it runs right down the center of our state in California. And so there's basically this negative suction of all of the air pollution from other areas of California uh, coming into the Central Valley, and especially in this area of Central Valley, which is called Fresno. So we gave uh, about a thousand families smartphones that we can then track them via individual estimate exposures to be able to understand to what extent they've all been exposed to uh, particulate matter, or in this case, uh, volatile organic compounds that are part of partially combusted diesel exhaust. And so with that, we can draw these kind of maps to look at exposures. And we've been doing this now for over 10 years. So you can get exposures for a week or three months 
or longer. So we have these 1,000 individuals. We uh, go down to the community. We ask them what they need. It's really important to make sure we have the perspective of the community first before doing these studies. Uh, we look at spirometry and questionnaires. We collect blood and saliva and urine samples. We do this in collaboration with our colleagues at Berkeley who really have done an incredible job at understanding uh, individual exposure estimates thanks to about nine collection sites of pollution on the rooftops of Fresno. So we do individual estimate air pollutions. We also collect PBMCs and plasma, uh, and then we perform high dimensional omics, cytop, proteomics, epigenetics, ABSEQ, ETAC-seq, and single cell transcriptomics. The pollutants that are measured are measured in a very standardized validated method. So we collect ozone, nitrogen dioxide, particulate matter, 2.5 microns or 10 microns. 2.5 is important because that can get into the alveoli of the lungs sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, lead, and other heavy metals. But then importantly, we also track wildfire smoke because the Central Valley now, unfortunately, because of Yosemite being um, exposed to wildfires given drought and climate change, uh, the Central Valley is now exposed to about 140 days a year of wildfire smoke. So we've been able to track wildfire smoke exposure as well. And wildfire smoke is about 10 times as toxic as typical air pollution. So we apply CYTOP or time of flight mass spec to these samples so that we can get high dimensionality of over 47 features at once um, at the same time in one individual blood sample. So this is a publication that came out um, last year showing that with the criteria air pollutants, we can get a good fingerprint of what uh, exposures that are associated with different immune markers. This is an example here to show uh, the variable importance in projection score systems for each of these immune factors and different criteria pollutants. And you can see not all criteria pollutants are associated with the same immune markers. And I think that's critical, but in any one individual, they are being uh, unfortunately breathed in at the same time. And here's another way to look at it. We also looked at CPG site methylation features using uh, pyro sequencing. And here uh, in these loci, IL-4, IL-10, interferon gamma, and FOXP3, in these uh, CPG sites, you can see the differential methylation that occurs in uh, these loci. And we, the reason we focused on these is because IL-4 um, is associated more with allergenic profiles, interferon gamma with potential to fight infections, and IL-10 and FOXP3 with more of regulatory pathways. So we then looked um, at protein uh, exposure. So it's important to also look at DNA, but as all of us spoke about also proteins. And so with the same individuals, we collect plasma and run that uh, via, for example, um, different proteomic platforms. And we looked at CRP, D-dimers, IL-18, IL-1 beta for the inflammasome pathway. And you can see here that in the individuals, when they're not exposed to wildfires, you can kind of get a sense for what at baseline they have a variability for. But then when a wildfire occurs during that exposure, and even after two days of exposure, we can start seeing signals. This is uh, at about three to four days of exposure of a wildfire. Um, and this is not within a mile of the wildfire. This is about 100 miles away from the wildfire because the plumes horizontally affect uh, quite a large number of people in California. So I'd like to move forward with the other cohort that we have. So that was our cohort in Central Valley, which is uh, part of an observational study that we've been doing for about 10 years. But we've been One also minute. looking, thank you. We've been also looking at monozygotic twins. And this is work that we've been doing with Mike Snyder. And this has been published in Cell Aging, but importantly, we looked at metabolomics. And what was really fascinating is we used a um, unsupervised approach and we collected uh, individuals from zero to 80 years old, looked at fuzzy semen clustering and identified over 770 metabolite abundances. But what was really fascinating is that what we detected again through ag agnostic assessments is that we could detect caffeine and black pepper uh, with increasing age uh, with all the dietary components of the individuals. And what was more associated uh, with the correlation of these metabolic profiles was twinship, i.e. genetics. So talking about genetic variants and genetic risk factors is highly important compared to just age alone. 
So um, I'll quickly wrap up. We're doing some more work on these twins with the tax seek, thanks to work with uh, Howard Chang. And so our conclusion and next steps are to make sure that we understand more about exposure analysis, use better technologies available, that we can look at the exposome. Um, Mike Snyder and others around the world are looking at this uh, more carefully to look holistically at any given person for any uh, personalized approach to their exposome. We need to also look at multiple exposures at any one time to understand the interaction of the exposures on uh, the genetic uh, risk factors of that individual as well as epigenetics, and then looking at longitudinal exposures over the lifespan is also important. So I'll stop there. And if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nadeau. And thank you for helping us focus on issues of environmental justice. That's um, really terrific. Okay, I see Judy has her hand raised. Go ahead. A great talk, Carrie. Uh, how systemic do you think asthma is? Um, and so you talked about the environmental components and air pollutants and so forth. Um, and the ra rationale for my question is uh, like, how useful is the blood for looking at rare subtypes like <clears throat> hematopoietic stem cells, pre-mass cells uh, that may be crucial sure. in asthma? Yeah. It's a great question. There's been a lot of studies on this. We've also done work with, in BAL uh, to look to what extent BAL reflects the blood and vice versa. There are an array of blood markers that one can now find associated with asthma. Um, and then what we have found is with wildfires, there's like a 50% increase in the risk of asthma for people that already have it. And then a lot of the pollution exposures increase uh, even just the induction of asthma. And we can actually follow that in the blood. So luckily, because of um, chemokines and because of cell migration, we are able to capture these unique features of asthma in the blood. Great Thank question. You. I see Aaron's hand. Go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, oh, sorry, quick, quick question. That was terrific. Where, where is the field at with being able to validate some of this large scale exposure? data with some of the new methodologies. Is there work to be done there? Um, are there, you know, the existing standards, you know, just give me a sense of like, how far do we need to go? I'm so glad you asked, especially with this symposium and hopefully a white paper coming out from it to be able to put some uh, possible suggestions for research. Uh, I, I do believe we are um, for some respects there but I think there is more to do, especially understanding the tools that we've discussed today and how to apply them best to any one individual under any given circumstance and context of their exposures. I think we're just sort of scratching the surface, but I'd love to see, like I said, looking at exposures over the lifespan and looking at multiple uh, exposure models because any one individual isn't just exposed. So let's say PM 2.5. So, um, so to answer your question, uh, you know, people like um, Carol Ober and others are looking at allergies and asthma, and we're doing a lot of work with her with her new methyl arrays. So I think getting this to big populations and sharing samples so that, that are well characterized so that we can really understand this at the level of the genomics that needs to be done is key. So I'm hoping that as we expand our cohorts, we can get there. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thanks. I see a question in the chat from David Craig. Do you see or suspect differences in privacy concerns by different groups in joining studies, collecting exposures via electronic approaches? <laughs> so that, that's, I think another whole symposium as well. Those are very excellent questions. I think I'm also on the IRB. And so we discussed this at length and especially when we are working with under privileged and under-resourced communities, and there are many sensitivities. Um, and we approach the community here when we talk to the Central Valley uh, groups. I think there's an appreciation of the science if you work directly with them. Of course, we also have to maintain uh, confidentiality and make sure that nothing that we do could then be linked back through privacy concerns to individuals. So this is a longer um, conversation, but to the extent that we can make sure that we ensure protections, that we explain uh, to individuals about any potential risk that's important. But um, I think especially with epigenetic studies, I, um, I have not found that we can directly link it back to any one individual, but that's always hypothetically possible. But 
I do believe that it's possible in this day and age, and we need to understand this more. So hopefully there will be more compliance measurements around studying people electronically and through whole populations. Thank you very much. It is now time to move on to the third third speaker, but I did want to point out there's one, one question from Nancy in the chat. So uh, Dr. Nado, if you can um, look at that question and, and offer an answer, that would be really helpful. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, let's move on to our third speaker for this session, and that is Dr. Corrine Engelman. She is a professor of population health sciences and director of graduate programs at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Her research focuses on the study design and data analysis of large scale omics, demographic, socioeconomic, behavioral, ph physiological, and environmental factors of complex diseases, including biomarkers and preclinical traits related to Alzheimer's disease and also vitamin D deficiency. Welcome, Dr. Um, Engelman. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation to, to talk to you today. Uh, let's see. It's not allowing, okay. Um, so I wanted to start by briefly describing our cohort and the multi-omic data we have available. I work with two cohorts, the Wisconsin Registry for Alzheimer's Prevention, an ongoing longitudinal study of initially cognitively asymptomatic individuals with phenotypic data from over 20 years of follow-up. And also with the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, a longitudinal study of cognitively healthy individuals, as well as those with mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. In addition to the phenotype, phenotypic data, we have genomic data, as well as longitudinal metabolomic and now proteomic data in blood and cerebral spinal fluid. In an initial analysis, my former graduate student, Virtue Darst, constructed an interomic network using pairwise correlations of the residuals of each type of omic data shown on the left after adjusting for relevant confounders. She then focused on the interomic correlations shown in this figure. Since we were primarily interested in gene metabolite relationships that could influence Alzheimer's risk factors. She found that no genes shown in blue were directly correlated with Alzheimer's risk factors shown in yellow, but several genes were correlated with plasma metabolites that were in turn correlated with Alzheimer's risk factors. Some highlights um, of this research were a cluster of cerebral spinal fluid metabolites shown in green in the, lower, um, in the lower right. And they were associated with cerebral spinal fluid biomarkers for Alzheimer's pathology and have since been replicated in an independent sample. Also a community analysis revealed that a cluster of genes, plasma metabolites, and Alzheimer's risk factors related to cardiovascular disease and diabetes that are located in the center left of the figure. This research just scratched the surface of what can be done with these types of data and opened up many additional research hypotheses to be tested. So I, um, for my talk, I was asked to highlight the barriers and opportunities in the longitudinal space and to draw out points that are generalizable to other ohms and diseases. So the first barrier that I see is a dearth of studies with longitudinal omics data over many time points to see timing and trajectories versus random variation. We likely need studies with at least four time points and Mike Snyder's work yes, that was um, shown yesterday suggested five time points to establish the timing and trajectories. Longitudinal metabolomics data are lacking for most, if not all diseases, but I would imagine this is the case for other types of omics data. And the second barrier is that most studies use a case control study design. So you can't be sure if changes in the ohms other than the genome are the cause or result of the disease process. And that's shown in the right in this figure here. And this leads me to the first opportunity in the longitudinal space. And that is to use longitudinal omics data in preclinical individuals to establish the timing and trajectory of 
pathologic changes. The barriers from the previous slide can be addressed by longitudinally studying individuals who are at risk for a disease due to parental history, for example, have not yet developed the disease. In the studies of Alzheimer's disease that I'm involved in, we have been following a cohort of adult children enriched for a parental diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease for nearly 20 years. We measure longitudinal biomarkers of the pathology of Alzheimer's as well as cognitive function. By doing this, we can establish the timing and trajectory of ohms associated with Alzheimer's pathology and disease. For example, in um, work by a former graduate student, Danny Panyard, he examined the cerebral spinal fluid proteome to determine proteins that were found in different levels in asymptomatic individuals with no Alzheimer's pathology in the brain. That's the A negative, T negative in this figure. And um, versus those with the earliest signs of pathology, amyloid plaques, the A positive, T negative in this figure versus those with more extensive pathology, amyloid plaques and tau tangles, the A positive, T positive. 61 proteins were significantly associated with Alzheimer's pathology after Bonferroni correction for multiple testing. The patterns for the top 10 proteins are shown in this figure with some proteins steadily increasing in the bottom, for example, in the bottom right, or decreasing in the bottom left with Alzheimer's pathology from the earliest stages and some not increasing until later in the pathology when the tau tangles had formed. All of the examples in the top row show this pattern. The take home message here is that you can learn a lot about changes that are happening in the body early in the disease process by measuring omics in individuals prior to clinical diagnosis of disease. Determining the, the timing of omic changes over the course of disease, of the disease process is important to distinguish omics that change early and thus can be markers of disease and inform therapeutic targets and lifestyle modifications versus omics that change later and can be used as diagnostic or prognostic, prognostic markers. And in this work by um, my graduate student, Eva Vasiljevic, it shows a very simple example for two SNPs within one gene, ApoE, which is the strongest genetic risk factor for late onset Alzheimer's disease. An ApoE risk score predicts the timing of mean cognitive differences shown on the left and the rate of cognitive decline shown on the right for the immediate memory composite score. And three other cognitive composite scores were tested but are not shown or shown that showed the same pattern but are not shown here. The mean differences between ApoE groups began to diverge in the early 70s. Well, the differences or the rate of cognitive decline diverges in the late 60s. We have run similar analyses with polygenic risk scores and cognition, as well as biomarkers of Alzheimer's pathology from the cerebral spinal fluid. Those results show similar trends. This shows longitudinal trajectories of an outcome by genomic data, which um, those are static over time. And we have begun studying longitudinal metabolomics, but we only have just two time points of metabolomics data on average. So it's difficult to distinguish um, change over time versus random variation. Our next step is to measure metabolomics and eventually other omics on additional time points. This is necessary to move from cross-sectional correlations to patterns of change over time to identify cause and effect relationships. So the second area, or the second opportunity is um, using heritability estimates if a large enough sample size um, exists to determine whether the ohm is influenced by genetics versus behavior or environment. Uh, we can do this by combining genomic data with other omic data. In this pinwheel plot of metabolomic her heritabilities on the left, each bar indicates the heritability of the corresponding metabolite. And the tall bars that reach out towards the exterior rings of the circle have a high heritability and are influenced by genetics. The shorter bars are influenced more by lifestyle factors. <clears throat> 
The different colors in this figure show different classes of metabolites, like amino acids, carbohydrates, or lipids. And we can use this information to inform further analyses. And that brings me to the, the final two opportunities. For omics with moderate to high heritability, we can use genomic data and Mendelian randomization to establish causality. So that is that, um, that omic data are predictors for the outcome versus influenced by the outcome. And for omics with lower heritability, they may be mediators of the relationship between behavioral or environmental factors and mediation analysis can be performed to better understand the mechanism. And examples of this were mentioned yesterday by Ji Hong Lin. One minute. Thank you. Work for both of these approaches is a major focus of my group currently. And I wanted to acknowledge the funding for this work by the, the NIA and then also current members of my lab. And with that, I'll, I'm open for questions. Thank you, Dr. Engelman for that very stimulating Oops, I, I would like to open the floor up to questions. I don't see any raised hands at the moment. Oh, yes, there's one. Allison. Okay. Uh, question. Yeah, very nice, uh, uh, Corinne. I wondered whether you had looked at, at CSF versus the plasma biomarkers or predictions to see whether it was sig sort of significantly different in the ability to make predictions with the two, because obviously the one of the challenges for neurologic and psychiatric diseases is if you have to collect CSF, <laughs> there it's harder to get people to do it, particularly uh, I would say in uh, minority populations, uh, and so clearly being able to find reliable markers in, in plasma would be significantly easier for, for experiments. And then, and then my second question is, is um, about timing and when do we need to start to collect longitudinal data in, for age-related diseases. I think there's a lot of evidence, right, that in Alzheimer's disease, by the time you have symptoms, the disease has probably been going on for 20 years. And I mean, do you think in the RAP study and others where you're doing adult children, do you, do you think you've even started too late? How, do you, you know, when's the optimal time to be collect, uh, starting to collect this data to be able to get the baseline rather than be going in when you've already got changes occurring. Right, so let me take that last one first. Um, so I, I think, so in RAP, we started um, collecting data. They were initially age 40 to 65. And um, we definitely, I think, have started um, based on, so we have imaging markers of both amyloid and tau, and we also have cerebral spinal, um, cerebral spinal fluid markers of amyloid and tau. and. Um, I definitely think that for most of those individuals, we've started early enough. Um, we, we um, you know, we, we are starting to see those changes. Um, one of the problems we're having in our cohort is that we, in general, it's too early to see changes in cognitive function. So those are just kind of after 20 years, starting to, we're starting to pick up, um, you know, associations even with APOE. So I, um, I think you would probably need to start like, for example, for Alzheimer's, if you started in the 40s and in early 50s, that's probably early enough. If you get much past the mid 50s, you might be, um, uh, it might be getting too late for some of the earliest pathologic changes in Alzheimer's. And then for your first question about how well the cerebral spinal fluid biomarkers correlate with plasma. Um, so just like for the, the existing, um, biomarkers that we have of tau and amyloid and, and, um, and some of the other markers, newer markers, it really depends on the marker itself. And so for the metabolomics, for that cluster that I showed in the lower right of that network analysis, um, we found that for that cluster, the prediction in plasma was not, um, not nearly as good. It, it was, there was a, a slight prediction. I mean, it's, or a slight, um, it, it was 
it was okay in predicting um, the biomarkers, but it certainly was not as good as cerebrospinal fluid metabolites. And so I think it's really going to depend on, I think there may be some, there are definitely some um, cross the blood brain barrier and, and that may be, um, or, or where the peripheral levels um, still correlate well with um, the um, levels in the cerebral spinal fluid. So I think it's going to depend on the metabolite itself or on the biomarker. Um, yeah. Thanks. There's one, one more hand raised. That's um, Mike Snyder. Go ahead. Yeah, maybe a related question is you have two measurements, which I know isn't very many, and you may not be able to answer what I'm going to say, but you have some sense of the variation from those two measurements. And so can you estimate how many measurements you need to build, you know, personal trajectories with, you know, certain kinds of confidence? Is it clear how many yeah, measurements you might need? Yeah, I, I don't think it's clear yet. I think we would need at least... Um, you know, really three or four measures on individuals, even to be able to start to answer that question. Um, yeah, I just, I think with two measures, even just what we've seen with our cognitive testing, with two measures, you just can't, um, you can't get a good sense of whether it's random variation versus there's starting to be a trend. So I think we're going to need at least three, if not four, uh, measures to really establish that. And for some of the metabolites or, pro, or proteins, um, you know, three, three may be enough and maybe for others, that's not going to be enough. So, but yeah, I, I just don't think with our data that we, we know that yet. And I assume these are fasting measurements. Is that correct? They are mostly, I mean, every now and then we have a participant that didn't even though they should have, but so far, yeah, they are. And we always perform a sensitivity analysis, removing those individuals. So yes, they are. Okay, I don't see any more hands. Uh, so thank you very much for your presentation. We will now move on to our fourth speaker of the session. Last but not least, uh, Dr. Tess Mersha, who is the Associate Professor in the Department of Pediatrics at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. His research interests include genomics, genetic ancestry, racial disparities, personalized medicine, and bioinformatics. Dr. Mersha's work focuses on integrating multiomics with statistical genetics and bioinformatic methods to uncover the molecular architecture of medical conditions, such as asthma and asthma-related allergic diseases. And Tess will talk to us uh, today about using a multiomics approach to better subtype heterogeneous patients and predict patterns. Thank you, Dr. Mersha. Thank you, John, and uh, thank you everyone for uh, attending Friday afternoon. So I uh, will be brief. Three speakers addressed, uh, I think, very nicely what I, am, I share their view. So I'll be very brief. So I'll start with uh, uh, a summary of probably a, a summary of my slide, which we put together and submitted for publication recently. So the hope of, of, of a multiomics integration is we gain from this uh, uh, integration a synergic effect. And, and uh, be able to uh, accomplish some of the tasks I listed here, and I will go through some of them. Uh, and, and in terms of endotyping, especially in allergy-related diseases and predictions. But uh, as you can see, the integration problem uh, process we discussed yesterday has uh, challenges and opportunities that uh, we need to uh, come across and have some kind of standard approach. So why we need on the multi-omics, it's already discussed yesterday, because if we focus on one of uh, the, the target, we used to be on genomics, we always miss the rest of the, the puzzle. So that's why we need uh, this uh, multi-omics integration. So in, in my talk, I will uh, try to address some of the approach to reduce patient heterogeneity and risk prediction from the role of multi-omics in, uh, in endotyping. And uh, you know, from clinical phenotyping, how we can use, uh, computationally use uh, uh, computational tools for endotyping and, of course, uh, multiomics and risk, for the, uh, risk uh, prediction and uh, patient uh, classification. So uh, finally, I'll leave you some with some uh, challenges and opportunities that we have. 
So uh, key milestones in the field of allergy, which could be also applied to other uh, other other areas, is that you know we start on uh, early on on, on uh, from the technology side and clinical side a number of uh, steps we accomplish. When I was a graduate student, we used to type few snips at a time. Now we have uh, millions of uh, at our uh, hand in a very quick time. So we reach to uh, a multiomics arena where we think of uh, uh, more endotyping, which is more close to the mechanism and stratify patients using some of the algorithm that we discussed already uh, in, in the machine learning arena. So uh, uh, coming back to asthma, uh, as a uh, as, uh, previous speaker uh, uh, discussed about the, the, the issue of asthma and air pollution, uh, asthma is, as, as most of you know, is highly heterogeneous, it's an, an umbrella term. So we may, two patients may share a phenotype, but uh, do they show really a mechanism? That's a challenge we face in, in the field. So uh, for example, you have, we have a group of TTH1, TTH2 type. Uh, as you know, as you probably heard in the literature, uh, even in COVID, some asthmatics are very severely affected, some are not. That's related to the type of TH1, TH2 relationship that is going back to their uh, immunity. So th there is heterogeneity we need to address through the endotyping uh, mechanisms. So from our uh, published a few years back, we look at the, uh, the data from CompCare using uh, from the DBGAP. And we actually cluster using random forest upright pretty much uh, clearly into three different clusters. We call them endotypes. So uh, sub, sub phenotype or endotype. And then we, uh, since we have a genomic data, we are overlaid to, to our ancestry groups. And, and, and uh, we actually come up with three ancestral groups, which are uh, uh, clearly different in terms of uh, uh, significance of, uh, in terms of their uh, global ancestry. So I, I think this is somehow showing us the translation of some, some of uh, our approach that we can cluster phenotypes and they look back the clusters in terms of genetic architecture. And we run actually GWAS in each clusters and we found new signals that weren't uncovered when we combined all those uh, uh, subphenotypes in an asthma case control status. So uh, we again use multiomics, uh, in, in this case, trans transcriptomic analysis to address the asthma puzzle. And we collect uh, uh, sample from different parts uh, organs, uh, including blood and nasal and all other different parts. I know we discussed the, the, the relevance of blood in asthma. We, we did, we look at those uh, relationships and the predictive accuracy of all these different uh, uh, sources of uh, uh, samples. So uh, as usual, we follow the standard uh, uh, approach of data analysis. Uh, I'm going through each of this, but this is a uh, conventional way of uh, doing gene expression. And we look at the uh, hierarchical uh, clustering. As you can see, uh, we have really a very high resolution when we run clustering based on the cells, the origins, the cell tissue types. And as you can see, uh, nasal and macrophage, and uh, it's not a cell level, but as tissue level, we see really a high resolution uh, at this point than a combined cell tissue type where you see it, nothing is uh, resolved at all. So we also look at the PC analysis. We see a clear uh, separation between uh, subjects based on their expression value and the asthma status. And we look at uh, the, the overlap. We further look at uh, the, the overlap between the gene, uh, gene expression level and transfer, and, and then further looking at the pathway level. Uh, as you can see in this fine diagram, we look, we actually got more overlap at the pathway level than at the gene level, which is uh, probably expected. And we did some, you know, uh, can we really use uh, easily accessible tissues or samples for less accessible tissue? We are, we are able to predict some of the surrogate uh, of this, uh, uh, the, the, the transferability of some of the marker to less accessible tissue. So the, the work is published, uh, probably I'm not going through the details on this time, but this was interesting work we did uh, recently. And, and then we look at further using deep learning uh, approach. In this case, we have a tool from my collaborator, Passnet. And as you can see, the AUC curve, uh, the, 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 uh, the deep learning approach uh, the has a, a tighter 
uh, uh, error and higher predictive accuracy than the SVM or the neural network. So we showed that some of the, uh, the, the accuracy gets even much better as you use uh, more advanced uh, methods in this case, uh, and also the prediction accuracy. So uh, uh, as, as Nathan talked about the PRS, we look at uh, different uh, types of PRS in terms of this is from the SNPs, this is from methylation uh, array, methylation risk score, and uh, genetic, uh, I mean, gene expression risk score. We pretty much got a good predictive process. Right now we're in the, in the, in the time of combining all these different omics type and uh, probably get a more accurate and applicable prediction accuracy. So in summary, uh, I think we have a high throughput multi-omics technology, but the challenge I face and I always try to address is we don't have really high throughput phenotyping and phenotyping is really the limiting factor in, in, in many ways. We need multi-layer models. The models we have now is more of a st st standard approach. Uh, as, we, uh, as the previous speaker knows, uh, longitudinal data is important, special uh, tractom data, the exposure, uh, is important, we discussed already, and the, the standardization and harmonization of clinical uh, information. This is really important because we uh, often talk big data from multi-center, big uh, from multi-ancestry, uh, 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 all these things, but uh, eventually how we really harmonize. So unless we have a clear phenotype, really doesn't matter how big data we have. So I, I really want to focus more on phenotyping because that's what we want to re end up correlating. So the multi omics based diagnosis requires a correct correlation of omics with detailed phenotyping. That's where we, the, the end goal is. So uh, in this case, we have a, a pipeline, uh, which is, as I mentioned, in the process of uh, uh, right now under review to use deep uh, learning uh, resolve clinical phenotyping and prediction in, 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 uh, in, uh, in asthma. So uh, uh, I will end up with this uh, approach. Uh, I know we talk a lot about multiomics, but in my view, uh, multiomics is one, one part of the equation. But we need to look actually the, the inbuilt or the, the lived experience, the, the, the all the ancestry, the clinical other factors, environmental factors, exposome. If we integrate all these uh, non genetic, non omics factors with omics, definitely we end up stratifying patient where you end up going to the precision uh, medicine uh, area. So I will end up with my acknowledgement with my group here in Cincinnati Children and uh, uh, senior mentors here and collaborators and the funding, uh, including uh, internal source and NIH. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mersha for um, that great presentation. And um, we do have time for some questions. If anybody has, um, looking at raised hands, I see one, Dr. Kelly, if you would like to ask your question. Hi, um, thank you, that was really great. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation. We're also very interested in um, endotyping and I was wondering for your endotypes, if you've um, done any work, you know, thinking about the longitudinal data, looking at endotypes with samples collected at different time points, do you tend to find that individuals cluster in the same way or in the same endotypes if samples are correct, collected at different time points? Yeah, that's interesting. Good question. Uh, we we have from the uh, DBGAP, uh, as you know, count cases have a longitudinal nature. We have the data, but we haven't looked at the longitudinal. Uh, sometimes, as you said, uh, as you mentioned, clustering, some of this conventional clustering, uh, it's it's very hard to know their you know consistency or can you replicate you know this much learning you can cluster but if you change something it may change in the next round so looking at more biomarker oriented classification like we did ancestry to classify probably that that will may that probably help a lot but we haven't tried yet the long term nature but that's great thank you thank you Judy I think you're next please. Cass, great talk, thank you. I've always been impressed by the heterogeneity of asthma. Um, can you, I haven't updated on the GWAS of asthma, like are, how substantial are the population differences um, in the asthma signals? 
Yeah, uh, thank you, Judy. Uh, there is no, I mean, th th there is some study in terms of uh, diverse population in asthma. Uh, to my knowledge, the, the majority of the Jewish catalog is based on European ancestry, but there is some uh, coming from UCSF and other uh, Latinos and others. There is a uh, few signals that are African specific, some Latino specific, but uh, you know most of these platform are based on European ancestry. So I don't, I, I wouldn't count those are really true differences because the, the, the source material, we use the, the, the genotype platform, all are created by the European as a, as a reference. So, it's it's hard to say there is uh, yeah so it has the same problem that uh, many of us including ibd has yeah i believe howard i see your hand up yes thank you for your talk i enjoyed that very much uh, you mentioned the importance of the phenotype data and i just wonder if you can tell us whether when you publish your your work whether there's a detail deposition of the phenotype data as well? What is the standard in the field? Because it seems to have other people to make use of this data or to make use of new, uh, new analytic approaches. There are some standards for genomic and epigenomic data, but what about the phenotypic data? Yeah, I think it, it's, it's coming now more and more with uh, uh, Dr. Nadu mentioned on site of and other, other approach where we can get more uh, biomarkers and, and detailed phenotypes, but uh, right now it's it's very uh, uh, high level. You know, some of the cohorts are based on phone uh, interview or some other you know high level weather uh, questionnaire based. So uh, I right. think, but that's actually what I mean. The clinical phenotype data, right? So it's, rather than a column that says asthma, yes or no, you have way more detailed information right, it, on these individuals, that's actually what you need. Yes, uh, yeah. yeah, definitely. Yes or no, it, it doesn't help because uh, we have this uh, extremely heterogeneous uh, phenotype, as I mentioned, that even the TH1, TH type is a good example. If you look at uh, COVID, uh, there is a mixed uh, relationship between COVID and, and uh, asthma, because if you are TH2, you have less uh, uh, risk to COVID and TH1, those relationships can be resolved with more phenotypes that we have. So I really uh, deeply uh, think phenotyping should be given uh, much emphasis because with the technology, we can, we can have really high throughput, all these uh, measurements, but how we get the phenotype is, is a big challenge to me. Thank you very much. And I think that concludes our this portion of the agenda. I'd like to thank all the speakers for those terrific presentations and also all the participants and the questions. And if you think of other questions, feel free to put, put them on the chat and, uh, and make sure that you indicate which speaker you want uh, to answer your question. And with that, I'll pass this on to the next moderator who is Jonathan Haynes, thank you.